how do you approach providing feedback to the individual versus providing feedback to the team and what are your rules of uh, thumbs there? Yeah, I think if it's, in, if it's important for the group to hear um, a certain level of feedback, I'll give an individual feedback in front of the whole group. Um, Cause I think if it's, if it's pertinent to the whole group, but it's just one player or sometimes I'll give it in front of the whole group. Other times I tend to, once they come out of a drill, or out of a scrimmage, I'll go up and talk to them on the sideline. So I might even, if we're in a scrimmage, I might say, you know, for instance, sake, um, Keely Froling, jump out, so-and-so jump in, and I'll, I'll talk to them on the side while the scrimmage is still going. Um, so I think it's important that for, for something that, you know, might be, as I said, is, is pertinent to the group, I'd say it to the individual, but make the group listen. Other things, it was more a, a technique thing or, hey, you need to pull your finger out or do something here or there. I'd actually pull them off to the side or wait till there was a break, you know, in the drill and go and talk to them specifically in that break. Or, you know, I tend to do it. They go and grab a drink. I'll say, Hey, why are you grabbing a drink? Come here, whoever it may be. Um, so I think you've just got to pick your time, whether it's something that the whole group needs to hear address the individual, but the whole group hears, or I just tend to do it during a drink break, sub them out of the drill to give them that piece of feedback and sub them back in. Perfect. Uh, if you had a team that was very competent skill-wise, what offensive and defensive strategies would you introduce first? I, th I think I would, I, I tend to go more away from, I guess, set structure as in running, say flex offense, shuffle offense. I, I tend to, let them play a little bit more in it and develop their understanding and reading and decision-making in the game. Because I think that's the fun part is you actually hand over the reins where you're not actually thinking about, I've got to run from A to B to C to set a screen, to be in like this position. I think there's a time and a place for it most definitely. But I think if you've got a group that actually can play, the fun part is allowing them to play and allowing them to use their own skill, their own decision making, and their strengths in regards to that. And I think you can like do both, but I tend to err towards the side of, I guess, more motion based offense than what I would a set based offense. And as I said, I think there's for both, it's good. Um, defensively, I think, you know, what you guys with New South, I, I think I'd be super disruptive um, up the floor trying to, I, I guess, full court man-to-man -man defense is like number one. Then you can actually get into some trapping full court, but being disruptive as possible. And as I said, going back to it, it really highlighted, I guess, last week when I went and did the session with the COE girls, it was more so just a session on be as disruptive, energetic, have as much ball pressure, be all over it as possible. I just, it really highlighted how bad offensively, like, and, and no disrespect to the COE girls, but how bad the offense was and how bad individually they were under pressure of taking care of the ball, being strong with the ball, lots of turnovers, lots of bad shots, just purely because the energy and the effort was there defensively. And so I would say if you've got that kind of group that can play like that, that would certainly be fun because we don't practice a lot of that kind of defense when we do practice either shell drill or five on five when we do our own practices. Perfect. Uh, are there any non-negotiables, uh, regardless of the age or skill level, you can suggest to coaches at a junior level? I guess competing is like number one. It's just coming in and like competing. And that, I, I guess competing can go be a whole lot of things, whether it's, you know, competing during a shooting drill, whether it's competing during shell drill to get, you know, two stops in a row. But I think it's just competing at practice is the number one. Like that's to me is like a non-negotiable. If you can't actually come in and, and practice hard and have great habits for practice, you, you can't just turn it on during the game. So one of my things is like non-negotiable is practice reflects the game. Is you, You'd want to practice how you play Communications, a big one at both ends of the floor is a non-negotiable. And that's like, obviously, the talk from both, not only an offensive perspective, but a defensive perspective. 
is a non-negotiable. And I think we talk about <laughs> communication, but I don't think we talk about a lot about actually being able to be good listeners. And I have some in my CAPS group that you'll communicate, but they don't listen very well. So there's, there's that art form of being able to listen and, and go do. Um, and I think that your non-negotiables come back to, I, I think, what your philosophy and what your style is and what you want to like emphasize. I think that's like some things is like non-negotiables about, you know, blow buys, non-negotiables about box outs. Um, and I think that the other thing around that is if you as a coach and I've done it before, if you let that go one or two or three times and then try and pull it up, it's too far gone. If you're going to have two or three or four non-negotiables, as soon as it happens, you've got to be on it and there's got to be, there's got to be a penalty or they've got to be pulled up on it. Cause like I've been a victim of like that where I've let it go and it goes like too far. So I think that if you're going to have like those non-negotiables, like, you know, if they don't compete at practice, what's going to be the consequence? You know, it can't just be, Oh, you just like let it go and kind of like, Oh yeah, it was a bad practice session today because then they'll just think that, Oh, well we can come in and do that the next time. Or you allow two or three offensive rebounds in a row at practice and don't pull it up or don't say anything or they don't have a penalty for it or there's no, you know, reoccurrence for it. As I think that whatever they are is there's got to be a consequence on the end of it, whether it's like sprints, whether it's stops, whatever it may be. Um, but my biggest ones are competing at practice, boxing out, communication are the, are the huge ones. And more so the non-negotiables should be about things you can actually control. You know, you don't always control where the ball goes in the basket, but you actually, you know, control some other things. Yeah, really good answer, mate. I totally agree. Uh, a good question, a whole bunch of good questions coming up, mate. Uh, have you encountered coaches being a slave to the practice plan where they take the enjoyment um, and the curiosity from the players? And how do you counter that? Yeah, I guess it's a... I guess it's learned and you've got to self check yourself. And I think it comes a little bit like with experience, but a little bit of just being able to, I guess, get to a point where if something's not working, whether it's like a drill, the players aren't getting it. It might be, you know, at times it might be like how I was like teaching it, how I was like explaining it. So it's like, it's on me as well, but it's also getting to that point that if they aren't getting it, just move on. And then, I always find out at the end of practice, why didn't that drill work? Was it like how I was teaching it? Was it my communication? Did you not like understand it? I, I think getting the reasons why, and sometimes it's, it's a pure case of, we don't actually give enough time to some drill work that we might think only takes five minutes, but in reality, it's gonna take 15. I'm terrible at that too. I, I do say, oh yeah, that'll only take five minutes. And 15 minutes later, we're still like doing it. So I think it's that fine line of knowing. But just I think getting a it's it's a to me it's a bit of a feel. You get a, you get a feel of like yep they're not getting it, and it's either you try to explain it different ways or they don't understand it. I think it's time then just to like move on. But you've also got a I'm big on you got to reflect at the end of the session as to why it didn't work, and how if that's so important how you're going to re revisit it or you're just going to throw that drill or that section out or go back and find out how you can do it better. Um, but definitely is like, and, it, and to me, it's like, I know it's frustrating for the players and it's frustrating for us because as coaches, we get frustrated, we get annoyed and then they're getting frustrated and annoyed. And then also practice just blows up and it's like not fun for anyone. And I try and make sure with my drills is like, nothing's over ever like trying 15 minutes because to have their attention seeking, especially for the younger ones, have their attention seeking for longer than you've got to teach it, talk it, I guess, stop it, reteach, give them cue points is like, you don't want to have anything more, you know, 15, to, uh, like the longest I think I do any drill for is probably shell drill because like I'm big on defense and that'll be like, they've got to get two stops or three stops in a row. Everything else is like short, sharp because you want the intensity up to, and I think sometimes if something goes really long, the intensity starts to drop. On the closeout, Gori, are you a baseline or, or a takeaway baseline, takeaway middle or square up kind of coach and why? 
Yeah, I was earlier on in my coaching days, I guess I was influenced by who I was coached and that was, I guess, false baseline. Um, but now um, more and more, it's I'm just like, keep the ball in front of you. It's so like squares, you know, obviously we'll play the scout a little bit more, but my number one thing is like squares things. And we're not like, if you're going to force left or force right because of, the, because of the scout, we're not actually just giving them open like driving lanes. And I guess my biggest, uh, I guess, light bulb moment was when I was coaching the gems, the under 19 team, we were playing, we were about to play Spain in a pre world tournament and Spain watching them were great at the dribble. They just drive it, kick it, kick it, drive it, kick it, kick it. And they just like move you around and get you in rotation. And all of a sudden there'd be a three or a layup and you'd be scrambling around. So pre worlds and going into that game, I just made the rule that I don't care if you get beaten, but you must stay with your player and you, you have the mindset of that you have no help behind you. Yes, there'll be help because we'll be in good position off the ball, but take the mindset of you have no help. So if you're beaten, you better scramble and stay with your player because we don't want three or four rotations. And we practiced it and did it and we only had like a day. And I think that that was a light bulb moment for me that I think that if you, I guess, put it to the players that that's how they've got to defend and that's the, the mindset that they've got to have, they can do it. And then we ended up flowing that all the way through, through Worlds. And it was like, have the mindset of, you keep your player in front, you're one-on-one, -on -one, you've got no help. And then that way they're more in tune, I guess, to, I guess, taking responsibility on their closeouts and their ball pressure that they're not going to get blown by. I love that coach. That's a, I think you've started another set of light bulbs around here. Yeah. It's um, like, and it was, it was just something that I thought like, if we play this way, then, you know, you're just going to forever be in rotation. So I was like more so on each individual to take care of themselves as far as their defensive, I guess, effort. How long do you spend <coughs> approximately on planning each practice session? Oh, I'm bad. I'm bad. And like, and this is like, I, you know, I'm a full-time coach, so I'm kind of like lucky. Um, but I, I'd at least spend an hour, hour and a half planning practice. Um, Cause I'm, I don't know. I'm just, I like to be planned. I like to be organized. I like to have my key points, what I want to like get out of it. And as you see, like I've got the whole last three years of each one of those practice plans in a folder. I type them up. I have them there to be able to like go back, reference, have a look back at what worked, what didn't work, reflect afterwards and go. Um, but yeah, I would, I would spend at least an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. How do you balance variety in your drills versus repetition of your core drills? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess early on, I guess for us, early on in pre-season, like for me is a variety of like different drills in like learning and like doing things. I guess when we're mostly in season, it's more compact because you're actually not practicing for as long. And I would, I guess... For people that are practicing, you know, when you only have like an hour um, practice session for like some coaches, I don't think you'd want to be introducing like three new drills in one practice session, just because it takes time to teach, stop, let them let them do the drill, let them get a feel for it, and then actually stop, reteach, go over your points again. So, I would say depending on the like the length of your practice session, but usually during the season. I allow probably the warm up is the most that I'll do different new drills, but the core of practice is drills that we've done before and getting repetition of like those things. We might throw in some new ones, definitely or some things, you know, instead of shell drill four on four, we might do shell drill four on three with rotation and do something like a little bit like different. So you're changing the core drill, but you're not changing it to something totally new. I think there is a case for like juniors, definitely like they want to be, I guess, get different experiences and have that like fun part about it. I do get it, but I think it gets back to how much time you've got um, and what you want to like emphasize. Two more questions for you, Gori, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, on your, on your practice plan, you had starters versus second five. Uh, number one, how often do you do this? And would you recommend this for junior coaches or should they just vary and mix their teams 
um, for every training session? Yeah, um, I'm I'm good and bad at it sometimes. Like usually, I'd like to do it more often where I mix, I guess, starters and bench players, or, or like bench or the second five. Um, purely, usually earlier in the week for us. Um, because we get usually four practice sessions. I'll mix the groups coming onto the back end of the week before games. It'll be starters versus like the bench, just, just to get some continuity because those, those starting five are playing together and got to get their chemistry right. Um, but I would say, yeah, I know I, I know I need to do a better job of just like mixing the groups for a more even practice early on in the week. And then I'd go later in the week into game prep and stuff like that. I'd have first five versus like second five. Uh, and I, I think it does too a little bit, creates a little bit more competitiveness when the, the benchies can actually kind of like take it up to the starting five too. We've had some great, we've had some great battles in amongst, like I know with the Caps group that the benchies like have taken it right up to the starting five, which is good. And I always, sometimes too, is there's not a, I've done it, Last, well, this past season, to give you an example, is Olivia Apupa. I explained to her twice over two days what I wanted from her at practice. Didn't do it and after several feedbacks. So during one practice session, I was just like, you're out into the bench team. You're whoever it was, Abby Cabillo, you come into the starters. And I think you can use it sometimes as a little bit to give someone a kick up the backside. If they're not practicing hard, if they're not doing what they ask, it's a good thing to kind of like go, well, you were a starter. And not that I'm big on starters, benchies, but you can actually use it to your advantage sometimes to send a message. Or to give someone a kid that's doing really well during a session is all right, you get to actually practice with the starters this week. Last question, mate. Uh, when coaching juniors, there is such a discrepancy of basic fundamentals between players, beginners and experienced. How would you address this without the more advanced players becoming disengaged? Yeah, good, great question. Um, some things I guess like I've done in past is put some restrictions um, on those better players. Um, so, you know, to like maybe use some examples. So I remember like back coaching with some of the boys at the center of excellence and stuff. It'd be like, all right, you know, get them aside. You can only score with your left hand today, you know, or you can only shoot the score with layups or you can only shoot jump shots or your job today is to get like four deflections, like on defense. So give them challenges within the game that maybe the other players, I guess, don't know. You know, or it might be your challenges today is like your player doesn't get an offensive rebound. So your your focus is just box out. But I, I, I it's a difficult one, most definitely, because I think that's the thing is like you, you're dealing with, say, any age group that's got some really good, naturally talented, skilled players and the others and how you balance managing both of those. I'd say give those others some challenges or some practice goals for themselves. And then that way they can keep themselves accountable to like that goal would be the way that I've done it in the past.